Well, good morning, everyone, and I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. We're glad that you have tuned in to our live stream, this special Christmas live stream. And if you would, take a copy of God's Word, if you have it there with you. And Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53 is the chapter that we're going to be looking at this morning in God's Word. And what I want us to do is to read Isaiah 53 together. And so we're going to read God's Word together. And we're going to be talking today about the incarnated, crucified, risen Christ. And so this special Christmas message is devoted to unfolding, unpacking the message of Isaiah 53. And so if you have your Bibles turned to Isaiah 53, let's begin reading at verse 1. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. That's Isaiah chapter 53. May God bless the reading of his holy, inspired, inerrant word. Let us pray. Lord, we pray as we open this wondrous chapter this morning. Lord, as we talk about the incarnated, crucified, risen Christ, I pray your Holy Spirit would open these words to us this day as we celebrate this special Christmas day together. And so, Lord, we commit this message to you. We pray for anyone listening, if they've not trusted in Christ as their Savior, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would draw them to the Savior. And so, Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, I have been looking forward to this particular chapter in Isaiah's prophecies because out of all of the chapters in Isaiah, perhaps there are none as important as this one. And we have been in this series of messages over Advent, we have been talking about uh, the glorious songs about Jesus Christ. And the reason we are calling this series the glorious songs about Jesus is because there are certain chapters in Isaiah's book that are called servant songs. And so what we've done over the last several weeks, we have looked at these particular chapters in Isaiah, and we've noted how they all portray to us the Lord Jesus Christ and what it would be he would accomplish. And let me just remind you of those chapters, as well as the themes of which we discovered. In Isaiah 42, we saw the compassionate, submissive Christ. Then, in Isaiah 49, we looked at the incarnate, sent Christ. We looked at Isaiah 50, noting there the willing, submissive Christ. And then, last week, we began to consider 
this important 53rd chapter by noting the 52nd chapter, which is a prelude to it. And there in Isaiah 52, we saw the beautiful gospel of the crucified, risen Christ. Now, just as a footnote, there is a fifth, fifth song in Isaiah, some of whom uh, ascribe it as also being a servant song, and that is Isaiah chapter 61. Now, we're not going to get to Isaiah 61, but if I were to assign a theme to Isaiah 61, it would be the soon coming glorious Christ. And the reason why Isaiah 61 is important is because uh, that is the first biblical passage of which our Lord Jesus Christ is recorded as having preached. And you can read about that in Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 18, when he preaches there at the synagogue in Nazareth. But out of all these various servant songs, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah is the most important. And as I said earlier, this particular chapter, we are assigning the theme, the incarnated, crucified, risen Christ. Now, why is it that the 53rd chapter of Isaiah could be considered the most important chapter? Well, whenever you consider how many times it is cited in the New Testament, over a dozen times we find it being quoted by the apostles. Certainly, such themes as substitutionary atonement, such themes as the Lord Jesus Christ suffering for our sins, all are introduced to us in this 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Furthermore, we understand that it is impossible to understand Christ's first coming apart from his crucifixion as well as his resurrection. So let me just read to you a few verses from the New Testament, particularly those that are associated with the Christmas story, just so that we can see why we make the claim that you cannot understand the meaning of Christmas apart from Christ's crucifixion. Matthew 1.21 says this, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's Matthew 1.21. And then Luke 2, verses 10 to 14 says, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. That's Luke chapter 2 verses 10 to 14. Now you heard in those New Testament citations references to Jesus Christ as our Savior. Isaiah 53 proclaims that truth. It has been said by many that Isaiah 53 functions as a fifth gospel. The other four being, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now certainly we know that in these early chapters that we just saw there in Matthew and Luke that we see the, the references there being made to salvation. Now as we come here to Isaiah chapter 53, we also see it too referring to salvation. How would this Savior, of which Isaiah 53 speaks, how would he accomplish salvation? If you were to read on in Luke chapter 2, you would read episodes of Simeon holding the infant Christ in his arms, telling Mary that a sword would pierce her soul. And then when we find Jesus in the temple, it is during the time of Passover, no doubt purposeful in revealing to us that this young boy came to be the Lamb of God. And what Isaiah 53 does it gives us a prophetic glimpse into how the Savior would bring about the salvation necessary to save sin sinners. And so today in this message, we're going to look at the incarnated, crucified, risen Christ. Now as we look at this 53rd chapter itself, we can note the following divisions. The first three verses deal with his incarnation. Then verses 4 to 9 deals with his crucifixion. Then verses 10 to 12 deals with his resurrection. And so you can see there a progression, his incarnation. That's how he came into this world to be our Savior. His crucifixion speaks about the mission for which he came into this world to be our Savior. And then his resurrection validates all that he accomplished as our Savior. So let's look there at Isaiah 53 
And note there in verse 1, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Here we see in these first three verses of Isaiah 53 reference to what we call Christ's incarnation. Now I want to draw your attention there in verse 1, particularly to that second question where Isaiah asks, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now I want to zero your attention there on that phrase, arm of the Lord. Now we see this used throughout Isaiah's prophecies. That term, arm of the Lord, is an, another way of talking about a visible manifestation of the Lord, of Yahweh. And it's interesting how we find in those infancy narratives that in Luke, how Mary in particular, in her song that she sings called the Magnificat, she says these words in Luke 151. Luke 151 says this, He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. That's Luke chapter 1, verse 51. And so that song that Mary sang as a way of celebrating the fact that she was going to be giving birth to the Lord, she is saying, she is attributing all that God has done and how he had done mighty deeds with his arm, associating that arm with the one who was now in her womb. I find that interesting there in Isaiah 53, verse 2, where it says there, for he grew up before him like a tender shoot. There we see portrayed the early days of our Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity. The Greek translation of the Old Testament in Isaiah 53, 2 reads this way, for he grew up before him as a boy. So you can see that what Isaiah is doing here he is giving us the early days of the Lord Jesus Christ in his infancy and in his boyhood. And of course, the overwhelming question concerning his incarnation is this. Who has believed our report? Have you believed in, his, in the report of God's word? Have you believed that Jesus Christ came over 2,000 years ago? He being truly God from all eternity, he came, took unto himself true human, humanity and to become man for our sakes. Paul writes these words in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, concerning the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. And so he describes there how Christ is the one who was revealed in the flesh. Now when we talk about this manner of incarnation, of what do we speak? Well, the late Dr. Adrian Rogers once commented on the incarnation as follows. He was so much man as to not seem to be God, and yet so much God as to not seem to be man. Nevertheless, this same Jesus, being fully God, came to be also fully man to provide a full salvation for us who are fully sinners. The incarnation constitutes a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. The eternal Son of God, the second person of the Holy Blessed Trinity, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, being one God in three persons. It was the second person of the Trinity, along with the Father and the Spirit. The second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. He was the one that entered into our world, into time and space, and through the virginal conception wrought by the Holy Spirit, he would become the man, Jesus Christ. Now, he never ceased being God. He ever remained God. But nevertheless, he came to be man for our sakes. Recently, in 2016, there was a particular statement, a doctrinal statement, a confession called the Word Made Flesh that was produced by Ligonier Ministries. And I wanted to just read it to you because it's quite beautiful, but it also gives to us an explanation of the incarnation. And you can find it on ChristologyStatement.com. And this is what the Word made flesh tells us about the incarnation. Quote, 
We confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh and rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, He became truly man, two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us, crucified, dead, and buried. He rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us, He kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet, priest, and king, building his church, interceding for us, and reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. End quote. Now, in my estimation, the most important words in that entire statement are these, for us. That's why Christ came. <laughs> he came for us. We read there in Matthew 1, 21 to 23, he's not only to be called Jesus, but he's also to be called Emmanuel. You know what the word Emmanuel means? God with us. And he being God with us, he came to be man for us. He came to provide salvation for me, for you. And if you will buy grace through faith, if you will trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord this day, you will have the greatest Christmas you will ever have. So Isaiah 53 presents to us his incarnation. But now let's look at verses 4 to 9, and it is there that we look at his crucifixion. Now I find there in verses 4 to 8 reference to what we call his suffering, and then verse 9 speaks of his death and burial. So let's look at verse 4. We read there, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. There we see in verses 4 to 6 reference to the suffering of which the Son of God would undergo. Now, verses 7 to 9, what verses 7 to 9 do for us, they expand upon what Isaiah writes there in verse 6. So verse 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was a sign with the wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Think about the suffering which the Lord Jesus Christ underwent. He would go before the Jews, before Caiaphas, to stand trial to be examined, and of course they couldn't find anything wrong with him. Then he would stand before Pilate there in the judgment hall. And Pilate would examine him and he would tell the crowd, I find no wrong in this man. And Pilate was going to let him go, but the crowds insisted, no, we demand that you release to us a prisoner. And that was the custom of that day. And so they would release Barabbas unto them. And then they would shout, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And there we see Pilate saying, Behold the man. And then Pilate would wash his hands clean and, and as if to say, My blood's not going to be upon this man. His blood's not going to be upon me. But you see, our Lord Jesus Christ, He would suffer. Of course, He would have nails driven through His hands and His feet. In fact, you see there in Verse 5, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. In other words, whatever he was to undergo, it would involve the piercing of his hands and his feet. Now understand, when Isaiah wrote these words, they were written some 700 years prior to our Lord's crucifixion. Furthermore, they were written at least another 350 years before the Persian Empire had come on the scene. Now, what is the significance of the Persian Empire? They were the ones who would invent crucifixion. 
Now the Romans would come along later and perfect the art of this excruciating form of punishment, but it would be the Persians who would invent crucifixion. And we see that Isaiah, in starking detail, with the prophetic eye given by the Holy Spirit, is able to predict exactly how the Son of God would suffer. And why would it be that he would undergo this? Well, verse 5 goes on, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Now, some of your translations render that in verse 5, by his stripes we are healed. Now, as I was reading this, I got to thinking about that particular phrase, by his stripes we are healed, because quite a few commentators have commented as to what exactly is going on there. Is that referring to physical healing? Is that referring only to forgiveness of sins? Well, you'll notice if you go there in verse 4 of Isaiah 53, we note there, surely our griefs he himself bore. In other words, there is some manner in which the Lord Jesus Christ would bear our emotional pain. Indirectly related to emotional healing is this passage. In other words, we find that somehow, someway, our Lord Jesus Christ indirectly bore all that brings about our emotional pain. Now, we understand that emotional, psychological problems are collateral fallout from the sinful world in which we live. But we got to understand something, that even though this passage is indirectly related to that, that is not the central focus of what Christ would come to do. You see, the power for emotional healing is sourced in Jesus' character. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4 says this, "...who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God." For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. So we see there in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 to 4, the Father, He's the one who's the God of all comfort. And as we exercise as Christians comfort to others, we are participating in the overflow of the sufferings of Christ, which, as Paul says there, is ours in abundance. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I know this particular time of year, the Christmas season, is fraught with much depression, with much emotional struggle. But I'm here to tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ, He's here for you. He understands. He empathizes. He was a man who was acquainted with sorrow and grief. And and not only does that apply just uh, in His crucifixion, think about what He underwent when he was ministering here on this earth. He was rejected. He was, he was often scorned. He was ridiculed, made fun of. But not only that, but he would feel, he would sense the people and the heaviness which they bore. When he would see people suffering, he would cry tears. Our Lord Jesus Christ understands all of that. But then what about this issue of by his stripes we are healed. Is that talking about physical healing? Well, Matthew 8, 17 quotes this particular verse. Listen to it. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Now there in Matthew 8, 17, the particular context has to do with when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law of a particular fever. And so some have thought that, well, when it says there in Isaiah 53, verse 5, that reference is being made to him bearing our illnesses and our diseases, then that means that we have the guarantee that whenever we pray for healing, that we'll get it. But is that what the text is saying? Well, listen to Matthew 8, 17 again. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. This is not in reference to what Christ would accomplish on the cross in His atonement. Note there, the verse does not quote the entirety of verse 5. It only quotes a portion of verse 5. Now, there may very well be an indirect relationship, but there is not a direct relationship. You see, physical healing is mainly sourced in Jesus' purposes. 
Emotional healing is sourced in Jesus' character, but physical healing is sourced in Jesus' purposes. Which means that when we pray for healing, it may not be God's purpose at that particular point in time to give us that physical healing. There may be other purposes. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For these momentary light afflictions are bringing about in us an eternal weight of glory beyond compare, so that we may be able to walk by faith and not by sight. So that we may be able to walk by not the things that we see, but rather the things that we cannot see. In other words, all these purposes that are in, under the control of our sovereign Lord Jesus Christ, among those purposes... Include our, our included physical healing, but it's not the only purpose. So when we come back here to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, what is it talking about where it says, by his stripes we are healed? What is being spoken of there is the forgiveness of sin. Peter writes these words in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 22 to 24. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. That's 1 Peter 2, 24 to 25. Now notice there, Peter quotes the entirety of Isaiah 53, verse 5. And he gives us the proper way of understanding that verse in its entirety. Namely, it's not about the guarantee of physical healing. For if that were the case, then every single person on planet Earth who would pray for healing in Jesus' name, they would be healed. But yet we know there are people that are walking around. They're devout Christians. They love the Lord. And yet they cry out to God for physical healing. And sometimes they don't get it. What does that mean? Well, it means one of two things. Either the cross has failed, or perhaps I'm going around with the wrong interpretation. And I would vote for the latter rather than the former. The cross of Jesus Christ never fails. Now we must understand that the main purpose and the focus of the cross of Christ was to provide the forgiveness of sins. And there is a guarantee that's the guarantee of the cross. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And that's why Christ suffered. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 tells us this, For he died once and for all for sin, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So Isaiah 53 speaks to us with reference in his crucifixion of his suffering. But now notice there in verse 9, we see reference to his death and burial. Note there, verse 9 of Isaiah 53. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Now we know that in reference to the details concerning our Lord's burial and death, when it says there, note there again in verse 9, he was with a rich man in his death. You know, you know whom is being spoken of there? Now, Isaiah wouldn't have known his name, obviously. But we come to, uh, we come to Matthew 27, verses 59 to 60, and we come to discover their, the identity of the rich man in question with whom Jesus was associated. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. There we see Joseph of Arimathea. He was the rich man. Now you see, in terms of the overall message of the gospel, in reference to Christ's death and burial, the tomb is essential. Why is that? Well, consider this. The incarnation was for the Son to enter into death. The crucifixion was for the Son to experience death. The tomb provided the evidence that he was dead. But praise be to God, the resurrection meant he would conquer death. And that's what Jesus Christ came to do. 
So we've seen here in Isaiah 53, we've seen reference to his incarnation. And then we've seen reference to his crucifixion, especially when we talk about his suffering and his death and burial. But now let us consider his resurrection. Note there, verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge of the righteous one, my servant will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. One of the things, again, we must understand is that you cannot understand Christmas apart from Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. And sometimes, to illustrate this, I have people to picture a seesaw. So picture a seesaw in your mind. And to really understand the fullness of why Christ came the first time, I have on that one side of that seesaw the incarnation. So I'll put the word incarnation on one side of that image of a seesaw. And then on the other side of that seesaw, I'll put the word crucifixion. And then there's a little pivot point upon which that seesaw goes. And I put there the word resurrection. You see, in order to understand completely and entirely the message of Christmas, you must understand it's about the eternal Son of God becoming incarnated. But why did He become incarnated? So that He could go to the cross and be crucified. (laughs) But then why was He crucified? So that He could overcome death, hell, and the grave and become resurrected. Now, when you look here in verses 10, 11, and 12 of Isaiah 53, we can note this. We see there in verse 10 that His resurrection proved that the cross was pleasing to the Father. In other words, what was it and for whom did Christ die? He did it for the Father. The Father was the one that sent Him. Note there. But the Lord was pleased to crush Him. Does that shock you to hear that? The Father who loved His Son, they having shared from all eternity within that wondrous, glorious incomprehensible relationship of the Holy Blessed Trinity. The Father had loved the Son, and the Son loved the Father. And yet it says there, the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will, prol- he will see his offspring. Why would it please the Father to put to death the Son, to have the Son be put to death? Well, Jesus said it this way in John chapter 10. He said that the Father and He love one another. Let me just read it to you. John chapter 10. And Jesus here, of course, is speaking about how He Himself is the great shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 17 says this. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. (laughs) You see, He and the Father and the Holy Spirit from all eternity have planned salvation. It was already decided. The Son would go. He would become incarnated. He would go, be crucified, and then He would be raised from the dead. So the Father, He already knew the outcome. And thus we see that the pleasure was that the Son would rise from the dead. So His resurrection proved that the cross was pleasing to the Father. And that's important. Because if the Father did not accept the substitutionary atoning sacrifice of the Son, then that means all bets are off concerning our salvation because it was the wrath of God that had to be satisfied. Our sins deserve the wrath of God. We deserve the judgment of God. We've done nothing to merit the favor of God. And yet the Son of God took our place on the cross and all that He accomplished, it was necessary for it to be adequate sufficient and completely perfect in order for it to be accepted by the Father. Verse 11 shows us that His resurrection proved the cross applicable to believing sinners. 
Verse 11 says, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see to be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. Note there that phrase, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. That wondrous doctrine we call the doctrine of justification by faith. Let me remind you of it. Romans chapter 3, verses 21, 22, and 23 speaks to us about this wondrous truth of the doctrine of justification by faith, which simply means at the moment of saving faith, God credits me, imputes to me, the righteous life and death and resurrection of Christ because on the cross, God imputed, credited to Christ my sin. Listen to this, Romans 3, 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in G Christ Jesus. That's Romans 3, 21 to 24. You see, when it says there in verse 11 of Isaiah 53, my servant will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. The only way you can be justified is by faith alone in Christ alone. So we see that his resurrection proved the cross was pleasing to the Father, that the cross was applicable to believing sinners, but now let us notice one more thing about his resurrection from Isaiah 53, and that is it proved that the cross is ample to save believing sinners. You see, Christ there in verse 12 he was numbered amongst the transgressors. Why? So in bearing our sin, we could be declared righteous. Furthermore, it showed that the cross is enough, period. Note there the last two sentences of verse 12. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Remember what Jesus said there on the cross? My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus was praying there on the cross. And when our Lord Jesus Christ raised from the dead, and then 40 days thereafter ascended into heaven, you know what our Lord Jesus Christ is doing right now? He's interceding on behalf of his people. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ is praying for you right now. And that proves that the cross is ample enough to save believing sinners now that's isaiah 53 we've seen our incarnated crucified risen christ i just find this chapter to be utterly amazing wonderful true do you have you trusted in this incarnated crucified resurrected savior you know the bible makes it very plain today Maybe some of you already, you've opened your Christmas gifts. I'm sure many of you have been pleasantly surprised by what you have received. But do you know, God sent the greatest gift that could possibly be sent. John 3.16 says it well. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. You know what grace is? Grace means gift. God's free bestowal of the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. But now just as many of you, when you were waking up this Christmas morning, you had to receive your gifts, didn't you? They were being given to you, but you had to receive them, did you not? And that's exactly what you must do in terms of God's gift of salvation. You must receive it by faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. Maybe right now, there in that living room, as you're watching this message, maybe this morning, the Holy Spirit of God, He has shown you that inside your heart, you're all empty. But how would you like to have your heart filled today? Filled with the knowledge that you're forgiven that you're peace with God, and it's all because of Jesus. How about right now you just pray with me? Simple prayer. Something like this. Great God, I admit to you that I'm a sinner, that I've broken your law, and I deserve your judgment, but I believe that you sent your son Jesus Christ 
to die on the cross for me and raise from the dead. Lord Jesus, become my Savior, Lord, and treasure this day. And I pray, Holy Spirit, help me to live for Jesus from this day forward. This I pray. Amen. Wherever you're at, whenever you're watching this video, I'm here to tell you today, Acts 16.31 promises that when you prayed that prayer, it says this, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And so, I bid you Merry Christmas and let us follow the incarnated, crucified, risen Christ. God bless all of you.